Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Thanks for the introduction, Jeff. I know a lot of you are wondering, who is this guy in the wheelchair, and how do you get to end up being in a wheelchair? Well, almost four years ago, on the uh, Saturday of Thanksgiving, I went out for a bicycle ride with a group of friends. We went up to Harriman Park in New York State, and it was an unseasonably warm day. And I was thinking, this is probably going to be my last warm weather sport before ski season kicks in. Little did I know it was going to be me who got kicked in. We were almost done with the ride. Most of my friends had, had headed for home, and it was just me and Zach. A few miles from home, and then all of a sudden, an out-of-control SUV starts hurling toward us. It was 1 p.m. in the afternoon, and she had fallen fast asleep. I don't know how that happens. She hit Zach first. She sent him flying over the guardrail and almost into the nearby creek. And then she came for me, and she hit me head on without breaking. I was medevaced to the hospital after I went flying over the car and onto the pavement. I think about that moment in time every day, and I guess I will for the rest of my life. It was um, nothing I could do. The investigators said, no evasive action. It happened so quickly. By all accounts, I should be dead. In case you're wondering, I'm not. <laughs> At the hospital, they had a lot to do. They induced me into a coma, assembled a team of trauma surgeons, and they went through a checklist of things to do. Prevent me from bleeding out, reconnect my lungs to my aorta, address my massive internal injuries, figure out what to do about this femur that was sticking through my thigh, take out my spleen, and stabilize my spine. It was a lot to do. I don't remember a lot from my almost two months in ICU. I'll tell you one thing I do remember was when the neurosurgeon came into the room and he said to me, he broke the news that I would never walk again. He had to come into my room three separate times in order for it to sink in. I mean, I knew I couldn't move my legs. I had these big external fixators on them to allow my bones to heal. I just assumed once they were ready to come off, all would be good, right? I couldn't digest the news. How could I? I was 51. I was fit. I had done nothing wrong. And in a few seconds, my entire life as I knew it was destroyed. From the hospital, they sent me to rehab. I went to Kessler Rehab, one of the top rehab hospitals in the country. And it's particularly well known for treating people with spinal cord injuries like me. The irony is, Kessler is located in West Orange, New Jersey, my hometown. And this is not the way I wanted to head back. Particularly after what I had written in the yearbook 33 years earlier. Think back to 1978. I was a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. Who from New Jersey wasn't? And we were asked to submit a picture and a quote. I didn't know what to do. I figured, I'll choose the last line of my favorite Bruce Springsteen song, Thunder Road. It's a town full of losers, and I'm pulling out of here to win. It seemed so witty at the time. <laughs> but like many things that I did in high school, not very well thought out. And I regretted it almost immediately. Back to West Orange and Kessler. The loser, me, had returned. On my first physical therapy session, they sat me up and I passed out. It was going to be a long road. Every night at Kessler, I'd sob myself to sleep 
and hope that when I'd wake up in the morning, the nightmare would be over. It wasn't. And then the next night, and the next night, and almost every night for the almost 11 weeks that I was there, I sobbed myself to sleep, hoping with all my heart that this was a bad dream and I would wake up and everything would be back as it were before. It wasn't. When I was discharged from Kessler, I came home. But the, the enormity of everything that happened prevented me from moving forward. I kept saying, why me? Why did this happen to me? I had a lot of trouble letting the anger go. Why me? My wife Betsy said, why not you? Stuff happens. It happens to everybody. But what she didn't say, and what we both knew, didn't just happen to me. It happened to her, it happened to my three daughters, and it happened to those friends and family who loved me. But for me, it was a constant. I just couldn't get away from it. You know what, I was even ambivalent about having visitors come see me. Because when people came to see me, it brought the reality back home. It made it all the more real. There I was, this dazed, scrawny paraplegic who could barely move. Over time, my mental well-being started to improve a little bit. I couldn't, I couldn't point to any one catalyst that made it better. But I guess in bits and pieces, I started to resign myself to the way things now were and to make adap adaptions to it. But one thing kept gnawing at me. As much as my wife Betsy was so attentive to me, she was also helping my kids manage their lives. And they were doing great things, and they were moving forward through high school, into college, academic, athletic accolades. And me, I was still standing still. And then I realized I ran the risk of them moving on without me. I mean, their lives were going on. And I didn't want to miss them. So I decided to re-engage and to become the father and the husband that I was before. At about this time, a year and a half ago, one of my closest friends died in an equestrian accident. She was an incredible human being. And she strongly believed that we all have a responsibility to make a difference in the world. But the difference is, she went out there and did it. She was a native South African, and she built a residential school in Rwanda to help the orphans of that genocide. Her death hit me really hard. At the funeral and then afterwards, I kept imagining, what would her family do to have her back with them, even in a chair? And here I was, in a wheelchair, but there for my family, and I didn't even appreciate it. One of my favorite movies, and one that I've seen many, many, many times whenever it's on TV, is Shawshank Redemption. And one of the lines struck me. Tim Robbins and the Andy Dufresne character says, get busy living or get busy dying. And that hit home. I realized, yes, I'm in a wheelchair, but there are things I can do. I can contribute. But what would I do? I couldn't go back to my career on Wall Street, where I traveled once or twice a week in the US and numerous times to Asia. That just wasn't going to be practical. But I had to find something to do. And as it turns out, my experience after the accident threw me into the world with a first-hand first look at the world of caregivers and caregiving. Look, I had a caregiver now. I had helped my parents manage their caregivers. And it quickly became apparent to me that the system is expensive, frustrating, and inadequate. 
So what could we do about that? Well, when I was discharged from rehab, my insurance gave me two months coverage for caregiving. OK, two months. Two months are over. Now what do I do? I need a lifetime of care. And when you're paying out of pocket, an agency is expensive and restrictive. What I really wanted to do was to hire a caregiver privately. And I realized that that's what many people do. In fact, maybe most people, when they look for care and they're paying out of pocket, they choose to do it privately via word of mouth. But what I wanted, I wanted to know, was it possible to know whether my caregiver was reliable, trustworthy, or even a criminal? I couldn't. There was no way to know. And I figured that the home care system that we have in the US is broken. And I could come back with a better model. And that's what I've done. I've named my company Lean on We with a W. So what we've done is we've created a network of caregivers. And on that network, you have pre-screen vetted caregivers fully visible on the gallery of the website. So a family that wants to hire a caregiver privately, they can come on the site, and instead of using that caregiver that their neighbor's uncle used two years ago, they can get access to our highly recommended FBI fingerprint checked caregivers. There is no greater peace of mind you can have for somebody coming into your home. As the business has progressed, I've been reinvigorated. I've reengaged the society. Get busy living or get busy dying. I've made my choice. I mentioned that we called the company Lean On We. Yes, it's a play on the Bill Withers song, but it's also an acknowledgment that you need a team to lean on when support is needed. Every morning, my caregiver comes into my home. She helps me out of bed and into my wheelchair. I lean on her. I get support. And I push on, and I get busy living. Thank you very much. <laughs>